and thank you for arranging this webinar. We are really pleased to be here with you to have uh, despite everything that is happening, uh, still we continue our work, as you can see, uh, and we are speaking to uh, a lot of um, in, in a lot of webinars, and we we are amazed by the amount of uh, of support we're getting. So thank you for this. So okay, so basically, um, yeah, my name is Rula, and I will be telling you a little bit about what Al Haq does. And that would, in a way, also explain why it has been targeted. And then uh, also to tell you about the designation itself and what implications does that have. So um, al-haq, uh, it means actually um, be right in Arabic. And it has been established in 1979. It is the first human rights organization, registered human rights organization in Palestine and in the Middle East. Um, Al-Haq's work has evolved. Um, firstly, it was working mostly on documenting information, documenting violations that were happening uh, to individuals and uh, collective and collective uh, rights uh, of Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories, irrespective of the perpetrator. So uh, we document uh, violations that has been taken place by the Israeli occupation forces, uh, as well as the Palestinian authorities and the de facto um, uh, authority in Gaza. Um, we document violations, um, all sorts of violations. Unfortunately, the, the amount of violations are extremely high in Palestine that we have so far actually documented about 300 different categories of violations that are taking place uh, in Palestine and, and towards Palestinians. Al-Haq also does, um, in a, so after documenting the information on an international level of uh, international law and, and uh, human rights principles level in terms of um, the documentation itself, that we can actually use this kind of documentation for litigation, that's one. And the second is that we can also use the information um, for advocacy. And uh, so these two, and advocacy, of course, and litigation, um, it, it is related to our uh, relationship and the, the different special procedures um, that we uh, reach out to, whether it's the UN or it's the uh, international, uh, international uh, different international organizations, civil society organizations, etc. Um, this is another part of our work. We do have work that has been done and is continuing uh, to be on the ICC, the International Criminal Court, as well as uh, Business and Human Rights, uh, which is the looking into corporates and corporations that are um, violating human rights, basically, of the Palestinians. Um, in addition to that, Al Haq has a center for uh, teaching um, uh, applied international law. So basically putting all the theoretical knowledge that you get from legal schools uh, into actually what it means uh, to be applied in a place where the violations are taking place. We also have um, a lot of reports that are done on uh, legal, deep legal analysis from legal experts and scholars uh, that, that analyzes the, the, the continuation of the violations. Um, and we also are, um, we document all sorts of violations. So which means that our targets and the people we work for um, are people who have suffered human rights violations in general and not one specific uh, violation. However, we do have an, an exhaustive um, coverage of the demolitions and of the killings. And that has been done since 1979. So we started the first department was the documentation department and the monitoring department, which was in, in the 80s, in the early 80s. So this is basically what Al Haq uh, has been has been doing or is doing, um, and it is the only voice um, that actually reaches out uh, to 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 the outer world because we also have accumulated a 
lot of experience um, into how to document in, on a very professional manner and as well how to use this information and which channels are there out there in the international community and actually the national community into how to um, how to convey these messages that we have now at the the shrinking space of the civil society, including the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian civil society and the Palestinian organizations, is not a new um, is not a new matter. That you should really keep in mind. Um, the designation is one uh, extremely severe act that has been taken by the Minister of War on the. Um, in October, on the on the 19th of October, uh, the Minister of War, Benny Gantz, decided to take a decision to designate six of the civil society organizations as terrorist organizations. The six organizations work on different on different topics, but um, they are they are basically Adamir that is working for prisoners' rights, political prisoners' rights. We have Bissam that is a, a center for developmental studies. Um, the uh, women's committee, the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees that works for for women's rights, uh, especially in uh, in marginalized areas. And we have Defense for Children International working for children's rights. And we have the Union of Agriculture Work Committees which work with farmers and also in, in the most um, vulnerable areas in Palestine. So you see it's a, it's a coverage of the entire sectors of the most vulnerable um, protected persons according to international law that were targeted. Um, all of these organizations were uh, actually established and, and started working before even the existence of the Palestinian Authority. So that was, most of them are, also with um, from the 80s so the designation actually went out on the on the 19th of october um, uh, under and the, the act of um, of terrorism uh, the israeli uh, anti-terror act of 2016 and what it meant is according to the civil law uh, and and it meant that the, the organizations are uh, considered to be terrorist organizations and that was complemented with um, um, with a military order that was issued on the 5th of November uh, because it covers also the, the the other framework the other legal framework that is applicable in Palestine so basically there are two or even more actually but in regards to this particular case there are two applicable legal frameworks one is the civil um, that is applied on the territory of, on, on Israel and the other one is applied to the occupied uh, Palestinian territories and we and the, those organizations are designated on both levels under the military order which by the way is and we inherited this from the uh, British uh, mandate of 1945. So this comes from the emergency laws of 1945. And, and um, in, in relation to that, the, the, the military order was issued outlawing the six organizations as being um, illegal organizations. Now, what it means is that all our actions um our work in the offices our meetings uh, our partners our donors they're all today under the threat of being um harassed or maybe we are also under threat of being detained uh, our uh, materials archive um our computers uh offices could be confiscated and closed um we could also face problems with with banks by actually uh, for the Israeli occupation authorities to to confiscate and put hand on the uh, on the funds that are coming to to the six organizations, but of course as well as Al Haq. So these are the implications that that we are facing. Of course, in addition to detentions and imprisonment, so we do. Uh, fear uh, that these things could start uh, being implemented because according to the laws and the designations, they are allowed to do this now, uh, according to their uh, laws, which by the way, today we, we saw the apartheid report 
explaining how the system entirely is now um, assured as being and and uh, as a system of apartheid, but also as the the state is is uh, committing the crime of apartheid. So the system and the crime and the system usually it covers also the legal the legal system. Now I just want to finalize my intervention by saying that we, because we know, because we have been working with the human rights issues since, since the, the beginning of the 80s, we know what the, the, legal, um, uh, the legal system, the Israeli court system, the legal system, the judicial system looks like. Um, we are not going to go to the courts, the Israeli courts, because we do know and we have proof that there will not be due diligence, there will be there will not be fair trial, especially that we have been in contact with um, the the military attorney, and he replied to us when we asked for the evidence to be to like give us the evidence so that we can move forward. They said that the entire designation is actually based on a, a secret file which means that we can actually go to court having not have not knowing what kinds of evidence we have and these are basic legal principles or all around the world um, so there will not be a fair trial that's why we decided uh, not to legitimize this israeli uh, judicial system and therefore we will not put our our faith uh, in 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 those in this kind of systems um, I'll, I'll get to you, Susan, now, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions coming up that we can raise different issues uh, later. So, yeah, Susan, please go ahead. Uh, thanks a million for that, Rola. And um, I'll just continue on and discuss, like, um, some of the financial impacts and um, the, the financial objectives really underlying these, these terror designations. Um, and basically what it all comes down to, like Israel has been really strategically targeting our organizations um, since Palestine acceded to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in 2015, uh, as Rola already mentioned. Um, but since then, like pretty much nearly every two years, we see these kinds of targeted attacks um, by Israel on our finances. Um, so Israel has really tried to like cut off the funding to our organization so we can't work um, and that we won't be able to supply evidence to the International Criminal Court and carry out our very high level advocacy as well on the international stage. Um, so we saw Israel establish a number of years ago a Ministry of Strategic Affairs, and the, the whole purpose of this ministry um, was to smear Palestinian human rights organizations um, who were working with the court and who were also working on issues around the boycott, divest and sanctions movement. Um, and basically, um, these, uh, the, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs was publishing um, a number of reports um, insinuating that Palestinian human rights organizations had links to terrorism, but also recommending that the EU and third states States would stop their funding um, to Palestinian human rights organizations. So there was a series of reports at this time, and um, with the Money Trail 1 report in 2018, with the Money Trail 2 in 2019, and then terrorists and suits in, in, in January 2019. And these were basically um, a series of defamatory reports, and each more heinous um, and defamatory than, than the last one. Um, and then we saw like nearly every two years these kind of targeted attacks. So straight away in September 2015, um, uh, for Al Haq, um, our, our European donors um, were sent forged letters. And these letters were, were said to come from the Palestinian Authority. And they were alleging um, that the organization was under an investigation um, from the accounting firm Ernst & Young um, into allegations of fraud and corruption. Um, and when we traced all of this, it turned out that um, both the Palestinian Authority and Ernst and & Young um, both refuted being the source of these letters. So it was coming from an entirely different target. Um, and then two years later in 2017, again, we saw these kinds of attacks on our finances. We had funds um, that were supposed to be coming to Al Haq, um, and these were returned um, by the bank um, to the funder. And again, these were after letters by the Palestinian Monetary, with a Palestinian Monetary Authority letterhead. Um, 
alleging um, that um, our organization did not qualify to transfer these funds. Um, again, we did an investigation into this and after lots of delays um, and lots of procedures, it, really, it turned out that these letters had not been sent by the Palestinian Monetary Authority and in effect, in, in effect had been forged. Um, in 2017, we got right to the horse's mouth. Um, the um, Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs um, at the time was visiting Al Haq in Ramallah, um, and he relayed that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu had actually specifically directed him to stop funding Al Haq. Um, so we're really getting to the we're really getting to the nub um, of these uh, kind of targeted attacks on on Al Haq's finances. Um, and then in 2019, Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs um, uh, claimed that it was, it was successful in uh, closing down bank accounts right across Europe and the United States um, associated with Palestinian NGOs. And it said in particular that it had closed, um, that the credit card and visa cards of Al Haq um, had been closed and those accounts had been closed. Now, this again was fabricated because um, Al Haq never had uh, Visa card or MasterCard accounts. So there was no accounts that, that were to be closed to begin with. Um, and then right on cue two years later again, um, in May 2021, um, Israel um, again picked up on its financial attacks, and this time it circulated um, a 74-page document of evidence around to different EU states um, right across Europe, but also to the United States as well. And this again was another attempt to hold the funding of our organizations. Um, there was a 74 page document of, of so called evidence, um, which attempted to link our organizations to terrorism. Uh, this was completely unsubstantiated and was met with complete criticism by the EU member states. Um, however, there has been some, um, has been a chilling effect by this. So separately, what we saw in May 2021 of this year um, was the European Commission um, separately in response to this file. And um, they froze um, a project funding that was supposed to be coming to Al Haq as a precautionary measure. Um, there was an audit, a very, a very rigorous audit of Al Haq during the summer. Um, and the conclusion of this audit was that there was no breach of any obligations and there was no um or there was no finding of irregularities um but then israel um gave more um sus sus supposed evidence um, to the european commission and again our funding was suspended and it continues to be suspended onto this onto this time again as a precautionary measure um while these investigations are ongoing so we'll probably hear about the outcome of this in march um, but we're now at that time will be almost 10 months since the original funding suspension. Um, it must be noted that this, the original 74 page document of evidence um, that was collected and paraded around Europe um, by Israel um, only contains a half a page on Al Haq. Um, and this half a page contains fabrications from an unrelated party who it turns out was interrogated under torture and who submitted that anyone who is not a PFLP operative um, is prohibited from working at Al Haq. Um, so besides the obvious fact that this is not even reliable um, and that the EU itself has human rights obligations to disregard torture evidence, it's also just completely ludicrous and laughable. Um, I can personally attest to the fact that there really is a rich um, and diverse team at Al Haq um, and our policies um, as a matter of principle, like politics is really left at the door um, of the organization. We have a very, very strict adherence to international human humanitarian law and international human, uh, human rights law frameworks. Um, and this is not only the basis for all of our work, um, but it's also the common and unifying language um, in the organization. So um, as the time has passed on since May and since the uh, designations in October, what we've really seen is a chilling effect from these designations um, and what I would call is a, a damaging deference um, of third states to Israel and um, basically stalling fundings over protracted periods of time um, and waiting for this future kind of big reveal of evidence um, that Israel is promising to, 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 to bring out. Um, 
So in December, we had the Union of Agricultural Workers, um, they received a letter from Oxfam um, and that the EU had ordered Oxfam to, sus um, to suspend the funding of um, and not enter legal commitments with the Union of Agricultural Workers. And also to, again, take this precautionary approach to all the civil society organizations that had been designated. Um, so following this, and the Union of Agricultural Workers suffered a funding termination based on the political allegations in the Netherlands. And at this time as well, Al Haq's funding on a Dutch project was temporarily suspended. And this impacted our core corporate accountability work in the organization. So since then, it's everything has been reinstated and everything is fine. But these kinds of um, stops and starts that we see with our funding um, as there's investigations and precautionary measures, this all sends shockwaves to the organization. And it really has um, a chilling effect on the ability of us to carry out our work. So all of this is taking place, these kinds of um, precautionary measures and suspensions, despite the fact that there really has been unanimous support across the board for us. Like we saw in um, immediately after the designations, the EU representative for foreign affairs, Joseph Burrell, had said that the EU had not received any convincing evidence. And then in December, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, um, condemned the designations as arbitrary and that they were based on vague and unsubstantiated reasons, um, including claims related to legitimate and entirely peaceful human rights activities. Um, and she said that they could be viewed legitimately as an attack on human rights defenders. Um, but despite this, we've seen Israel just continuing to send these random files um, of spurious evidence to third states. So the most recent of these was um, to Norway, where they sent like a, a bunch of materials in Hebrew. Um, and this has required these third states to translate the materials. There is significant cost in translating these materials. And again, it's contributing to delays in process. And this is all, this file, is still the same shambolic and discredited file. There's no additional information. And it's really been, it's really been employed as a stalling tactic right across Europe um, to delay the decision making and the transfer of funds to our six organizations. And like we know, like in just in from rudimentary elements of law that like justice delayed is justice denied. And the same can be said of these shockwaves um, and these stalling kind of this, this stalling that we're seeing from the procedures and processes that are that are put before our organizations. So these delays in funding are having really um, serious consequences and, and effects on our organizations and our viability. So for example, like we can't plan like very far ahead into the year. We don't know what kind of funds we're operating on. Um, the progression of our longer term um, objectives is being impacted. And um, we have staffing difficulties and our organizations are really plagued with uncertainty because of these impediments that have been placed by third states um, who are deferring to Israel in in relation to these um, in relation to these allegations so um, in December we also faced problems sending payments outside the country through the banking system here so it's really um, impacting on our ability to secure like very high level services that we need for some of our projects um, and in, in addition to this the deliberate exclusion of our organizations from partnerships and coalitions really risks curtailing the important work that we're doing and representing and advocating and providing services to the victims of Israel's crimes who are now doubly victimized in this process. So the financial targeting of the six organizations really um, should be seen not just as an attack on our six organizations, but this is the dismantling of the entirety of the of Palestinian civil society. Like we really need to see this for what it is. This is a dangerous turning point in the history um, of the occupation and apartheid. 
Um, so like even, um, even aside from this, Israel has also submitted intelligence on other human rights organizations um, and is, is currently trying to cut funding to those organizations at an EU level as well. So we've seen this, for example, with the Palestinian Center for Human Rights. It's not one of the designated organizations, but it is currently being targeted by Israel. Um, at the level of the European Commission. So what we're seeing is a, is a dismantling of Palestinian civil society and a silencing of Palestinian civil society. So like, we do welcome the really strong show of solidarity. And we were, we were really overwhelmed by it, like in the aftermath of the designations, we had huge support from civil society right across the world. We had a statement from the UN Special Rapporteurs, and we had really strong statements from the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and from some third states as well. Um, however, now we're seeing we're at a time when Israel is accelerating its settlement expansion and it's dismantling civil society in the West Bank. So it's really imperative that third states, um, like the United Kingdom, um, act uh, to ensure that Palestine has a robust civil society, which is the backbone of a functioning dem democracy. And it was really critical to the functioning of a Palestinian state. And there are some various political initiatives which we've seen like across the world. We had a bill which was introduced in the US Congress by Betty McCollum. Um, and we've also seen various motions and resolutions introduced um, in various parliaments. We had a, a parliamentary petition in Canada. Um, there's various initiatives before the Catalonian parliament, before the Italian um, and the Brussels parliaments. Uh, and of course, in the UK, there was the early day motion which was tabled in October which we really appreciate. Um, but we were quite concerned with the kind of um, vacuous statement by the UK government, um, which hasn't really um, commented fully on the designation. There was a parliamentary question which was placed and the government basically said, uh, we're aware of the decision by the Israeli authorities. Uh, we will be seeking additional information to understand the basis of the designations. Um, and then they said human rights and civil society organizations have a vital role to play in the development of thriving open societies. And again, like for al haq this is not good enough. This is really a dangerous deference back to Israel um, to provide more information. And this really risks permanent damage to Palestinian civil society. Um, so just in terms of some final uh, recommendations, um, for us, these, this designation, this is a political designation and it requires a political response. So what we really need to see um, at the level of states is for the UK to use its leverage with Israel and really pressure Israel's Minister of Defense to urgently rescind the designations. And we really need to see this happening at a state level. Um, we'd also like to see um, third states um, and particularly the UK issue a statement of confidence um, in the six organizations and to condemn and to not recognize the terror designations. Um, and also for third states to either fund or to increase um, the existing funding and to expedite the funding to the six organizations. And also to ensure that their banking system and financial institutions are on notice that these um, terror designations should be treated as inapplicable. And for um, third states then as well to remove any terrorism clauses um, as internal conditions placed on donor funding. This is really problematic and is subject to abuse, um, particularly somewhere like um, in the occupied Palestinian territory where we see these terror designations just thrown around um, to dismantle Palestinian civil society. Um, and the real crux um, in terms of holding Israel accountable um, is to stop trading and to stop to stop doing business um, with 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 illegal with with settlement goods and settlement services and um, organizations that are illegally active um, out of the settlements. So it really is incumbent on the UK to introduce legislation um, to prohibit the import of settlement goods and services um, into the UK. And we'd also ask for the UK to end the sale and supply of military products to Israel as well, um, and for the UK to discontinue the UK-Israel trade and partnership agreement. Um, what we really need to see are some um, serious sanctions placed on Israel. 
what we've seen over the last couple of months is um, our, our acts of apartheid and their the, the, the final kind of inebriated acts um, of a state which has been operating with complete impunity um, and with an occupation that is now entering into its, its 55th year. So it really, uh, we really need to see um, serious actions taken by third states. These designations are not just silencing human rights defenders and dismantling civil society, these acts in themselves also constitute inhumane acts of apartheid. So these designations in and of themselves um, and the, the act of these designations, th this is a criminal act of apartheid. The targeting of human rights defenders and human rights organizations who call out acts of apartheid and are then silenced and are then targeted under the apartheid convention this constitutes an inhumane act of apartheid, and this is a criminal act. It's an act which amounts to a crime against humanity. These types of crimes need to be prosecuted. And they need to be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. So we would also ask the United Kingdom to ensure continued support for the International Criminal Court, continued funding for the International Criminal Court, and that the International Criminal Court and the investigation into the situation in Palestine is fully supported. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. That was just very distressing to hear, but very important. Um, we have had quite a few questions. <clears throat> um, if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the chat box. The two speakers are not looking at the chat box, but I will send it to them afterwards. I will be relaying questions to them. So um, first of all, I have to say, I didn't know that Al-Haq was one was the first human rights organization in Palestine and Middle East. That's quite, um, that's really impressive. So uh, well done to still be able to carry on. Um, I've got a question from Miriam Scharf. Um, do the speakers think that the Amnesty International report on Israel's apartheid, um, do you think it'll make a difference on the current designations? I leave it between you two to decide who's gonna answer the questions, who's best placed to. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make a stab at this one. Um, I think this is an incredibly important report. So this report um, follows um, follows the Human Rights Watch report and also the Beth Salem report um, and also a previous Yeshdeen report as well. And of course, going back a decade, uh, we, had a, we had a report from, from Al Haq as well um, back in 2009, which also called out apartheid. And it follows on from the work of Badil and other Palestinian human rights organizations who've been, um, who've been advocating and, and arguing that there's apartheid um, for, for decades now. Um, but this is, a, I think this is a turning point where we have the international um, organizations now, um, uh, now making findings and, and conclusions, you know, on apartheid and, and, and coming out. Um, in terms of the designations, I think it does have, it, it does play an important part um, because the, the legal framework is one of apartheid and it's apartheid on both sides of the green line. Um, and this targeting of human rights defenders, which Amnesty have also, have also highlighted um, and are also educating the, also educating the world on, um, this, is, this is also, this is also, this is also showcased. So I think it is, I think it is important, like we're, we're really, we're moving out of this. Um, we're moving out of this narrow framework. It's not. It's not abandoning the framework, but we're expanding our. We're expanding our vision as to what this is. This is an apartheid and a settler colonization, and a very small part of that is the ongoing occupation. So, these kinds of um, the. The kind of narrative that we have from from Israel the the, the whole time that there's um, this kind of intense conflict um, that we need to target various um, various kind of hostile actors that there's these kind of terrorists that need to be targeted the the kind of that the mask has been ripped off the face now um, because we know that this is this is apartheid it's secular colonization and these arguments have always been kind of very spurious arguments to deflect 
from the reality on the ground, which is one of a which is one of a, a colonization. Um, and settler transfer and the erasure of the Palestinian people. Um, so this is, I think the report is critically important from Amnesty International. Um, and it's really important to, to highlight and show that these designations are acts of an apartheid regime. And these, these designations in and of themselves are acts of apartheid. And these designations and these are this, this, these inhumane acts are acts which are potentially can potentially be um, be be brought before the international criminal court. So, I think this is. I think the more documentation that we have on this, and the more um, the more organisations that um, uh, that uh, publish on this, I think it's critically it's critically important for um, for the narrative and for explaining the reality um, for what it is. Thank you for that, um, Ian Scobie, whose birthday was last week. Um, says that Lynn Welchman has recently published a book on the history of Al Haq. I didn't know that, so I'll be checking that out. That sounds really interesting. Um, the report, the Amnesty International report, uh, the Q and A they published as, alongside it, and um, an editorial in Haaretz. We have just put them up on our website in the news section, so BalfourProject.org. Um, and if you navigate to the news section, you will be able to see the top um, little note is. From Vincent. It also went on our email list recently, yeah. a couple of hours ago. So do have a look at that. Um, from Donald Saunders, unfortunately, Israel does not recognize human rights for Palestinian people, neither do they conform to international humanita humanitarian laws when necessary um, in the apartheid state that they have developed. The world authorities do little to seriously oppose their actions. Um, you mentioned in your talk um, what the third party state sh should hopefully be trying to do. Um, but Donald Saunders asks, why is this so and why, what can be done to rectify? So maybe I can uh, jump on that one. There's, I think there are different layers. Um, I, I understood from the question that uh, he wants to know uh, what could be done to, to rescind the, the decision, basically. Um, and, and the other one was why, is, is that, does, does he mean why we are designated? No, why, um, why do the third party states sort of get involved so little, really? Yeah, well, that's uh, an entire webinar, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but yes, um, uh, we have seen uh, countries being very, um, some of them do act uh, on on a on a strong level, and others don't. It depends on the. It's a political. It's a political matter. Um, the occupying state of Israel does use uh, intimidation against states, against officials, um, to silence them. We have seen that, for example, now with Human Rights Watch. Just before they wanted to publish their report, they have. Uh, they have faced severe actions of intimidation uh, to stop them from, from actually getting out uh, with their report that they have been working on for the past four years. Um, so, of course, there is uh, a lot of resources that are going into, as my colleague said, uh, that there is a special ministry that is uh, out there putting pressure on countries, on donors, on human rights organizations, civil society in, in, in general, to actually try to silence um, these organizations because it does not want uh, to be criticized. It does not want to be called as, um, uh, as criminals. It does not want to be called as an apartheid state. And they do continue to claim that they are the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, although all the actions that we have been uh, seeing and the crimes that, and the violations that are taking place in Palestine exactly shows the opposite. Um, so that is basically uh, what, um, like in, in a nutshell, uh, how these countries are not being able to actually do more. So for example, to be, um, because everything also is related to the smear campaigns, defamation campaigns against even individuals, even politicians in different other countries are targeted. Um, so people are becoming afraid. People are becoming more 
uh, some states are bullied. For example, Sweden, after the recognition of the state of Palestine, they were, and that's the word that I want to use, they were actually bullied for four years until now they are just trying to rebuild uh, their relationship because of economical interests and political interests. Uh, but they have been cut off uh, from many, many uh, other countries. They have been, um, uh, they have been uh, accused of being anti-Semitic, et cetera. So this is, this is mostly why uh, some, some states are not uh, taking the right actions, but we are also seeing a different, a different um, more prosperous aspect, which for example, what we have seen with the, with the apartheid report today. Um, apartheid has been taking place for so many years, but today there are organizations and there are states that are willing to actually start taking um, their duty basically and, and come out with, with what's really going on and start taking actions, uh, whether it is through supporting other organizations that are working uh, to enhance and empower the human rights situation in Palestine or directly through their own interventions. Um, so I hope I, I answered um, the question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've got so many questions, so I'm just going to carry on. Uh, Peter Blackwood, how does Al Haq propose to challenge its designation given the choice not to challenge through Israeli law? Okay, shall I, Susan? Okay, so um, one thing is what we're doing here. So basically continue the advocacy, continue uh, the campaign uh, to raise awareness about this topic and how important it is that it does not go through. So our fear uh, as the first human rights organizations in the Middle East is that if there is one state in the world that is allowed to actually uh, execute the civil society and silence the civil society by a political decision, and this is not met by a real action from countries, from states, from uh, from people, basically, um, this will not look good for any civil society organization in the world, especially in the Middle East, for example, or any other place, because if this just goes by, what would prevent any state to actually take the same action whenever they have any type of of um, of, of a group that is actually mentioning and 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 revealing all the violations that are happening in that state. OK, we designate it as a as a terrorist state delegitimizing it of its voice and silencing it forever. So it is very important that such actions do not become precedents and do not become an, a, a normal thing that, that has no consequences. So this is one. The second is that for us internally, um, we have been interacting with the military uh, attorney uh, attorney general and uh, we have been just asking for what what is this evidence that you're basing the designations on show us the evidence so that we can also go we can go to court um, and so far there has not been any um, any response that they will be giving us those evidences and we also um, think again, we do not believe in this system. And but what we will be doing, and that's for sure, is that we will continue the work. Even if they come and, and seal down our offices, we will continue the work because we believe that we have uh, a duty and the honor to be actually the voices of the people that are being targeted on daily basis everywhere in Palestine and even in exile for people who are not um, uh, get, getting their right to return, for example, and many, many other violations. We cannot simply be silenced because we have this huge duty towards the people that we have been fighting for and uh, documenting their violations and trying to be their voices around, around the world. So we will be challenging this together, us and you and everyone that is willing to to do any kind of action like what susan have said but also even even tiny individual uh interventions could be uh very beneficial and even just you coming to such a webinar raising awareness about this and talking about it could be a, a great uh, deal in in creating um 
a more justice voice uh, among people, basically. Well, many of us are standing behind you and think that you are incredibly brave for carrying on um, during this time. I have a question from Eamon Meehan, Meehan, sorry, um, for Susan. What coalitions um, have Al Haq been excluded from? So this was a um, this is a letter that was this was a letter that was circulated um, to Oxfam um, from their from their donors. I think it was from the um, but from the European funding. Um, and they were directed, we, this only came out in December, um, so they were directed to not partner um, with the six organisations, and this again is a precautionary measure, um, and to, so to, uh, we, uh, we, haven't been ex we haven't been excluded specifically from any coalition, but we've been, the advice and the guidance from um, coming to Oxfam was that they should exclude um, they should exclude the six organizations um, from any partnerships um, while the while the um, as a precautionary measure while the um, while the suspensions were were ongoing and while the investigation was ongoing. Um, so technically, like we like technically in terms of the in terms of Oxfam, like uh, my understanding is that like we we wouldn't be we wouldn't be engaging with them and UWAC wouldn't be engaging with them um, and the six organizations. So um, we don't know if there was anything and anything planned um, we didn't have anything specific planned ourselves um, but it has a chilling effect on any on anything um, that we might that we might want to do um, so there's there's difficulties there and there's I mean it's all about risk assessment and there's just various risk assessments but it's been incredibly heavy-handed um, coming from um, some third states not all third states some third states have been incredibly supportive um, and have really um and have really kind of um stepped up to the fore like ireland has been incredibly supportive and um irish funders have been incredibly supportive as well and we've seen the same um in denmark um but there's just been some some contagion and some chilling effect um as various as these various risk assessments are are put into operation um and again these are precautionary measures they're so-called temporary suspensions and temporary freezing of arrangements but what we're trying to say um is that these temporary these, these temporary measures which are in some cases going on for 10 months um, that these are actually having a very a very real impact on our work you know and it's actually these are seriously affecting like these are seriously affecting financial flows into the organization and it's affecting like potential work that we could be doing on the ground and I think in terms of um, Oxfam this would affect the Union of Agricultural Workers Committees much more directly than it would affect the work of Al Haq, for example. Um, so this affects communities on the ground in Area C um, and very vulnerable communities. Um, so there's it's a it's it's a it's hugely problematic. Um, and it's um it's 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 disproportionate. And we would even say at this point that there's uh, that there's now complicity. Um, between these member states and Israel in completely disseminating and eliminating uh, and, and, and working towards the elimination of our organizations. That once, the, once these third states are engaging in this dance, in this tango with Israel to prolong, um, to prolong the investigations and to prolong these precautionary measures, that this in itself is um, a punitive tool and that it's the organizations themselves, staff and the organizations and our projects um, and our beneficiaries that are being affected and are, that are being impacted directly. And it's, it's, it's hugely problematic, you know, and like, of course, we, we continue and we're resilient. And I know that like most people that you will talk to, like, and certainly everyone I talk to in Al Haq, like we will work, like no matter what, if they come and, and bulldoze Al Haq to the ground, like we'll be like, as we all say, we'll be in a bunker underneath, like still continuing to work, you know, and like if they freeze all the money in our bank accounts, like we will still be there in rags and starving and we will still work. And everyone is like committed to the values um, of Al Haq and committed, you know, to them 
to working towards the self-determination and um, the realization of the self-determination of the Palestinian people as a whole and their collective right of return as well of refugees and exiles um, to their homeland um, and absolutely committed, um, committed to this and also committed towards um, towards the accountability and prosecution of perpetrators of Israeli criminals um, of, of, uh, of mass atrocity crimes, um, especially in Gaza and around the, the West Bank and, and Jerusalem, and for historic crimes as well. Um, and, and hopefully there will be um, a tribunal at some point set up to investigate such crimes which have taken place against the Palestinian people um, since 1948. Um, but at minimum that we would investigate these crimes um, since 2014 um, before the International Criminal Court. And we will not stop um, until we see justice um, for the Palestinian people and we see um, uh, reparations and restitution um, as well. Sorry, thank you. No, thank you. Um, I've got two follow on questions from that. Another uh, another one from Eamon Meehan, it was the second part of his question, asking whether Oxfam had actually cut its funding from the organizations, if it was funding, I believe the Union of Agricultural Work Committee. Um, and then from Joe um, Rosthorn, I hope I'm saying that right, can we lobby Oxfam? So in terms of in terms of Oxfam, the only uh, the only information that I have is from this letter, um, which was which was divulged to us, and this again was in December, so it's quite recently. It's just about four weeks, uh, four or five weeks ago. So I don't know in terms of the financial flows whether um, whether the funding has been cut off from the organisations. Um, but this is something that we can certainly follow up on, um, and I know De I know Eamon Meehan outside of this um, outside of this, so I can certainly follow up on this afterwards um, and follow up and, and follow up with any um, and, 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 and follow up with any information that's needed. Um, but the the simple. The simple answer to that is I don't I don't know else any any more information outside of the the warning that was sent out, um, and it was the warning in itself which was problematic um, to us. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Monica Spooner. Um, her and her husband Roger are the ones that actually set up the Balfour project in the first place. Um, so Monica asks, would you please outline the laws that have been inherited from the British mandate? I think the question came in when Rula was speaking. Um, can you refer me to a paper or a book about these? Yeah, so basically what I, what I have said is that um, the uh, outlawing, because again, I said that there are, there are two frameworks, legal frameworks that were adopted by, with the designation or related to the designation. Um, the second one, which came in November, is based on the 1945 emergency laws that were set by the British mandate uh, on, on Palestine, basically. So these are the laws that, uh, that, that the military, um, uh, that the military um, general decided to, to rely on in, in the outflowing of the organizations is there, we do have most of the military orders, by the way, that are um, uh, regulating or that are controlling the lives of Palestinians in the occupied territories are based on, on British, uh, based on British laws, most of the military orders, because that was how um, the, the entire, um, the entire country was run uh, by different orders. And so that just continued. Um, so we at al Haq do have a library of the military orders. Um, they are all issued in, in Hebrew after the, uh, the establishment of the occupying state. And uh, we do have uh, archived uh, military orders. Um, I can definitely, um, after the call, if you can connect me to her, I can definitely send some links about what are the laws that derives from um, the British uh, mandate back then, of course. That's great. Thank you. I will follow up on that and include them in the transcript of this, um, this presentation. I've got uh, two questions about the ICC that I'm going to ask together because uh, they tie in quite nicely from John Mitchell. Are you optimistic slash realistic that ICC, that the ICC will invoke litigation against Israel? 
and from Lynette, Lynette Hughes, what is the state of play with the case in the ICC? Uh, thanks a million. Yeah, we can, uh, I, I say we're um, optimistic um, and realistic. I mean, we've, we've always known um, from the very start and Al Haq has been involved um, in this since the first preliminary examination back in 2009. So this is a long, long trajectory for our organization um, when we first um, when we first uh, were involved with that um, Article 12.3 um, declaration back to Ocampo. Um, but we, um, we know that at the end of the day, um, we're looking at um, potential prosecutions um, of just a handful um, of actors, like we're not going to get justice for every single um, for every single Palestinian victim of these crimes, and um, um, and the court was never set up to do that. You know, the court is a court um, essentially of 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 last resort. Um, it's based on principles of complementarity, and it is really only it, it only has resources to to investigate. You know, a, a handful of crimes. So we're very we're going in with eyes wide open. You know, to that reality. Um, we've always been very honest and very open, you know, about the limits of the court. And also, like when we're discussing with um, with victims on the ground, and even with our with our own um, with our own um, uh, with our own interactions, we're very clear on on what the limits of the court are, and also the length and the the length of the process. Like we're we're looking into, like for Al Haq, this is a, this, these are long term actions. We're looking into, you know, potentially over a decade, you know, more of work with the International Criminal Court. We know this is a long term vision for us. And um, so we're under no illusions of what's in front of us. Um, but we also, just in terms of the state of play, uh, but I would want to say like we're incredibly um, or incredibly uh, optimistic about this. And like we absolutely 100%, um, you know, have faith in the court and believe in the court and believe in the independence, you know, of the court. And so far, like um, 2021, like was an absolute turning point in the history um, of the process before the International Criminal Court for us, like in in March, we had like a victory uh, at the court at the pre-trial chamber, where we had the court um, making a finding on the territorial jurisdiction of the court over crimes committed in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. And this really green lighted the way, you know, for the prosecutor to, to continue to open the investigation. And immediately after that, we had the opening of the investigation. And that was then nearly six years since the preliminary examination had been opened you know so this was like an absolute huge turning point in the lifespan um, of the court and then we had um in April, um, following on from this, we had the rescinding um, by Joe Biden of the executive order in the United States. And again, this was a huge moment in the court, um, not just for the prosecutor um, and the head of the complementarity division who'd been designated under the sanctions list in the US, but also for organizations like Al Haq and Palestinian organizations on the ground, we were next in line, like we could have been designated for materially assisting the court under this executive order. So we were well aware of the ripple effect that was coming down the line with us, but that was then removed, like when the executive order was rescinded. And um, then we had in, in the summer, we had a new prosecutor, Prosecutor Khan, um, who took over the file. Um, and we all kind of drew in a nervous breath, you know, of what was going to happen with this new prosecutor. Um, and then by October, it became very, very clear um, that Palestine was dodging a bullet of the new prosecutor. Like the, when things came up, it was Afghanistan that got, that got the cut. Um, and Palestine, Palestine continued, and immediately we saw Israel pull out the heavy artillery um, and started designating the organizations as terror organizations. It became very clear that Palestine was still on the agenda, that the investigation was still continuing at the International Criminal Court. There was no change with the new prosecutor. Everything was continuing as before. Um, and then suddenly Israel 
started designating the organizations and especially um, the organizations working in the West Bank, because we all know that the absolute rubber fastened case in relation to the International Criminal Court is the settlements case. So all the organizations, all the main organizations in the West Bank are suddenly targeted. <laughs> you know, I mean, you couldn't make this up. Um, it, this is like a direct, it, this is a, a direct attack on all, all the organizations that can gather evidence to submit to the International Criminal court and we're, we're we know this is that we know this is the agenda and this has been the agenda right from the start like right from from 2015 when the when the state of Palestine um, acceded to the Rome statute is since then we've seen like a very direct targeting um, of our organization and even in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs even in their um, even in these reports, it mentions, you know, Al Haq's work, you know, at the International Criminal Court and as a leader at the International Criminal Court as being acts of terrorism. You know, it's very open about it's very, very open about this and what this is all about. Um, but anyway, this is the, the, the current state of play for us before the International Criminal Court. Um, we're we're um, obviously always cautiously optimistic, but I would say optimistic nonetheless. Thank you for that. Um, I've got two questions um, that are on this pretty much the same um, from Baroness Jenny Tong. Um, what support does Al Haq get from the PA? It's been hardly mentioned at all. And from Tony Greenstein, basically the same question in slightly different wording. What, if anything, has the Palestinian Authority done to help? Okay, so I can. Uh... Uh, take that one. So basically, um, I think one of the reasons of why now we are being designated is uh, because the situation, the internal situation um, and the violations of the Palestinian Authority has also been uh, increasing last year. We have witnessed, unfortunately, a lot of violations on, on different scales, on a higher scale, um, that we have been documenting uh, fully and that we have been uh, reporting on and that we have been calling upon the Palestinian authorities to uh, immediately stop the violations, especially related to the freedom of expression and uh, the freedom of assembly. Um, and as you probably know, the killing of the activist and human rights defender Nizar Banat uh, in the uh, in in July uh, in June this uh, last year also led to an acceleration of uh, the situation uh, deteriorating in a in a radical way actually what we can call it on on terms of of human rights violations so we we do analyze that one of the reasons in addition to the ICC and there are actually five reasons why we think we were designated now like the timing why are they using this time and not let's say in the 90s is because the Palestinian Authority they have seen the reaction of the Palestinian authorities and the Palestinian um, uh, Palestinian Authority forces whether it's in Gaza or here they have seen how the crackdowns has actually also uh, uh, included human rights defenders and included uh, Al Haq's team for example so they probably did this political calculation that this designation would actually, uh, it would be a good timing now. Um, another, but what we have seen from the PA so far, um, the president did come out and uh, call upon the uh, cancellation of the decision. And there are different um, ministries that are also providing and uh, giving us their support they do think that it is embarrassing because we are organizations that are registered under the palestinian law so this is supposed to be under the palestinian sovereignty so it is very embarrassing for them that uh, the occupying state of israel uh, actually comes and designates organizations that are registered under their laws under their uh, monetary control um so but they have been um trying to trigger uh, their uh, embassies around the world to actually uh, speak about this matter to, to lobby and advocate 
but let's let's be realistic on how much the PA can actually do. Um, there is no democratic country without a civil society that is healthy, and the Palestinian Authority do also claim that they want to be heading towards a democracy, and and for us not to to exist here uh, would also harm their image uh, of a state. Um, so they are doing like minimal efforts, uh, but they're still doing efforts and they also think that this is important to uh, definitely to rescind the, uh, the decision. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask the final question in a moment. Um, I'm going to uh, pop the El Hack website link into the chat box uh, when you're asking the next, um, answering the next question um, so that people can find out more about what you're up to and, um, and contact you if they have any more questions and so forth. Um, I would also like to uh, tell everyone in the audience that we are doing these events for free, uh, but we welcome donations and I'll pop the link in the chat box as well. Um, but you can find it on our website, balfourproject.org. There's a donate section. We now, uh, some of you might have seen, we sent an email around um, saying that you can become a friend of the Balfour Project. And um, that is, uh, you become a friend of ours if you make a donation of any amount, monthly or annually. It really helps us with uh, keeping our admin costs down, being able to plan a bit um, our, uh, for the future, knowing that we've had some financial security, <laughs> the Alhack ladies are nodding because I'm sure they have the same same uh, problems and, and issues and um, we'd greatly appreciate any donation that you can make I'll pop the links again in the chat box otherwise you can head over to the website and either make an ad hoc donation or uh, sign up to become a friend um, so the final question is from Martin Linton who uh, perhaps you've met he's former Labour MP who with his wife Sarah Apps uh, run travel to Palestine where they bring over delegations of MPs unionists and so forth over to Palestine. It's another website I definitely recommend everyone checks out, Travel to, the number two, Palestine. Um, he asks, has Al Haq received funding from the UK government? If so, when was that? Why was the funding not repeated? And has the British consul been in contact or been supportive? Lots of questions there. <laughs> Uh, I am waiting for you, Susan, because actually I don't know if we have been receiving any um, donations or any funding from the UK. I don't think we have. Uh, I don't think we have recently, and I don't know. Like, I don't know in the history of Al Haq if we if we have or not. Um, but in the last in the last couple of years, I know that we haven't. Um, uh, but I do know that. Um, I do know that there's um, that there has been um, that there's been contact with all the um, all the representatives um, here, and we've had um, we even had a, 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 a day of with sol of solidarity where um, third states and um, and European Union states as well um, came to Al Haq um, to to show solidarity. Um, and there was a kind of a, a, a diplomatic briefing um, just in, in the hall underneath our organization. So, um, and my understanding is that the UK representative was, was at this. I think he, I think he was. Um, so there has been, there has been some like on the ground here, like there has been um, some support, but where it matters in terms of like political statements and where it matters in terms of like rescinding the designations, you know, and putting pressure on Israel to rescind the designations. Uh, I'm really like looking for the rescinding of these designations as as a step towards like ensuring like the viability you know of a Palestinian state and ensuring the viability you know ensuring the continuation of the rule of law and to, for democratic processes like there's there's much more at stake here than just say organizations like we're really talking about the health of democracy um, in Palestine 
um, which is absolutely just it's it's just the situation is is just not it's not viable you know we had and as Rula already said earlier like we had um horrific protests you know um back um uh, with after the killing of Nizar Banat um where the Palestinian Authority and, and forces um supportive of the Palestinian Authority turned on the people and there was um there was violence on on the streets you know and it was al Haq and Palestinian organizations that monitored and documented you know this 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 violence and this this turn of events on the ground and we're really now sinking into a very very dangerous situation if human rights organizations are not able to continue with their work you know and it was it was this pressure coming from human rights organizations documenting this work and pressuring um advocating to third states pressuring the palestinian authority that we saw a back down of the palestinian authority you know and that's the work that we do like that's the work that goes on behind the scenes here and there's silent work that goes on here that nobody sees that keeps things getting a whole lot worse than it could be and it's really really critical that our organizations are able to continue doing this work um it is it really is um uh, it's a cushion um our, our organizations it's a cushion from some of the worst excesses um of violence and um, that were that that can, that can spill over here and it really is it's critical um that we have the support and it's really critical that there's a push for politicians to intervene and to ensure that the designations are rescinded and it really is a critical human rights moment um in the in the history of the the palestinian situation well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, like I said, you're incredibly brave and strong. And we've had so many words of support coming in through the chat. Um, if anyone um, has written anything in the chat box, I will be sharing it with the two speakers. So they will see your, your comments, your questions that we haven't managed to answer and all of your lovely supportive messages. So thank you so much, Rula. Thank you so much, Susan. And of course, thank you all the attendees for coming along. Um, and we will hopefully see you at the next uh, presentation. I've posted the links there in the event section of the Balfour Projects website. So um, just to give you an idea, we've got Bravo from Jean Fitzpatrick, what two great women, brilliant presentations, um, lots of supportive comments. So I will show them to you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. And let's keep the uh, good work all together. Thank you very much for having us and for listening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.